Thank you. Um, it is actually really great to follow um, Dee and Mark's presentation. Um, again, I think perhaps Joe or somebody was a bit visionary in looking at um, helping us to understand where um, some of the physical rehabilitation has moved forward and um, in terms of some of the virtual world. And I'm going to take a bit of a look today at um, where it's come from in the neurocognitive domain. Basically, um, we started to become involved in VR about five, six years ago, uh, and part of the issue was, and again, it started in the physical domain, um, because we had a lot of patients, um, and you're probably familiar with this, uh, lack of compliance in treatment. So basically, uh, a lot of individuals with significant physical issues not participating in treatment, and therefore not making the gains that they were able to make, so hemiparetic states, various movement, ambulation, and really just not realizing their potential in the context of rehab because they just didn't want to do a lot of the repetitive exercises or engage in treatment. So one of the things we started to look at is what would help increase this compliance. And we started to look around at VR, uh, virtual rehabilitation, and essentially then became connected with a few other sites who were doing the same thing. Um, and one of those areas was um, the Sunny Hill Center for Children in Vancouver. And it was interesting in our discussions with them is um, there was a lot of this great technology at these centers, so where people were integrating VR in the context of, of inpatient rehab and so on. But there was a real problem with the adoption or, or um, rehab professionals uh, actually applying it. So we have did a couple of studies looking at what were some of the barriers and issues related to the adoption of this kind of technology. Um, we also have just completed another study looking at that with another postdoc from, um, from Ottawa. So both essentially what we're looking at in terms of moving forward is how to integrate not just the physical strategies or rehabilitation but also look at the cognitive. So that's what we'll do a bit of exploration right now. Oh, sorry, I've got to find my little, there we go. Okay. So basically, VR is one of many technologies that's right now available for, uh, in the context of rehabilitation. So today we've heard a little bit about a number of different types of technologies, and in fact, Gentronics has brought some of um, VR, as particularly in the physical domain, into a very accessible level. And so I plan to tackle Mark later to help Gentronics or convince them to look at some of their cognitive development, but certainly with things like Connects and so on, has brought it into a more accessible level, whereas before the technologies are so, so big and onerous, and we'll take a look at a bit of that. Um, there's other, um, other technologies include computer brain training, QEG, and biofeedback, and other things that we've talked about today. But basically, uh, virtual rehabilitation is basically the computer hardware and software system that generates a real or imagined environment in which the person can interact. We'll look a little bit at what VR looks like, and then the integration and where we've come in the cognitive domain, and then some of the factors that, that have actually impacted how therapists have, have, have um, the uptake, basically, of this technology. So essentially what you're looking at right now is some of, um, some of the environments or domains that have been created with regard to virtual rehab. So the idea is, is that the individual, much like Mark demonstrated, um, sees themselves on a very large screen, and in that there's various physical tasks for them to do. What's really nice about it is that it's able to, to track a lot of precision movement. So in the context of physical therapy, has been very helpful in um, therapists being able to design specific programs, measure where they begin, develop different programs, and then you know, look at the outcomes. The only issue, one of the big issues with these particular technologies you can see is it's large. So it requires big rooms, big space, um, and a lot, of, a lot of overhead. So basically, a lot of this has at times been confined to inpatient um, or larger facilities with respect to, to rehabilitation. The other um, aspect of VR are what they call uh, what are headsets. And basically, um, as you can see, there's a lot of development of that for recreational purposes. So Sony's brought out a headset and basically um, 
The gentleman in the picture is designed to look at how cool that can look like on. I did contact Sony and found out that he does not come with the, with the headset. <laughs> he is available separately. So basically, also what you'll see is, is um, the next generation of VR with regard to um, I, um, iPhone use. So basically, you can create a virtual or have a virtual environment on your phone, and it slips into that headset device, and you can, and you can do the therapy that way. So again, now it's becoming increasingly accessible. When we talk about adoption, we'll take a look at that because it's a very important point. But basically, it's becoming increasingly, um, from this perspective, more accessible with regard to, um, to, to use. In the context of cognitive assessment. So traditionally, um, in the context, when we look at evaluating cognition, we look at how to break down um, various aspects of thinking. So we look at attention, we look at memory, we look at, and we break those down into various components. Basically, after an injury, we want to try to figure out what areas or where the breakdown is, or if there's a particular behavior, where in the chain the breakdowns occurred. So we tr that's part of the rationale in trying to break down various you know, cognitive domains into their varying components. So it helps us to understand if there's a child who's not behaving well in class, is it because they're not attending, they're not remembering what's going on, there's, you know, we, we want to understand from that perspective. What, um, basically with that, once we sort of understand all these component parts, then we try to put it together and figure out how it's going to um, how it's going to play out in terms of the actu of an actual functional environment, or how what's this going to mean? So if there's breakdowns in, a, in attention or memory, what does that mean when they go to work? What does that mean when they go to school? What does that mean when they're in social environment? So we've had to sort of infer a lot of that with the. With the emergence of VR, what it's allowed is people are starting to create virtual environments in which we can start to see how it breaks down. So basically the idea with VR and cognition, it becomes a forum where we marry the components of the problem and observe how it's going to play itself out. And it's kind of like a safe environment to play itself out because before you bring a child into the classroom or into a work setting or something uh, or a social situation, it allows the opportunity to see how things will, you know, or get some idea of how things will go. So it marries that function when takes some of the guesswork out. And it also helps to um, reduce some of the fear of the environment. So instead of, you know, just saying, okay, now we're going to go in and practice the strategies in the environment, you actually have an environment that helps an individual start to understand what the challenges will be and then be able to, you know, help reduce the fear of that. So examples are, so basically, we, in the context of these virtual environments, so we can set up classrooms, um, library, shopping, all kinds of different environments, and basically evaluate how the child is going, is going to you know, be able to perform a particular task within that, um, that actual environment. So watching to see how the memory, attention, and other issues may break down in that particular area. So in order to give an example, um, some of the current um, environments that have been designed is, is there's a V-Mall, which is a shopping task for children using the IREX technology. There's a virtual library, virtual week, virtual homes test, uh, virtual planning tasks, um, integrated motor and cognitive learning, city interpersonal negotiation strategy tasks as well. So those are for also for social settings and situations. We've seen in the social domain a lot develop in the last few years, particularly with respect to autism, and a lot of this now is being used too. Uh, we're seeing more with the TBI group because a lot of the social issues um, can be similar, and some of that technology is being used um, as a way to practice social skills or develop social skills with this particular population. So an example um, of, how this, of how this integrates in the context of assessment was there's a very nice study that was recently done. And as we know, for most um, TBI kids who have TBI, kids and adolescents, one of the big areas of difficulty is um, social context and learning. So we know that 
Um, basically, a lot of these children suffer from being lonely, dissatisfied socially, they have few friends. There's a high reliance on their family for their social, um, social interactions after their injuries. Typically, the areas of impairment that we look at or that we try to measure include things like identifying emotions, rating their conversational skills using videotape and so on, judging appropriate language, um, using theory of mind and so on. And basically, it's all done through narrative scenarios. What was very nice is, is that they took basically a task and um, that was basically previously when a, um, it was delivered verbally. So basically, the examiner would sit down with the child and provide uh, various social situations, set up the dilemma, and then ask the child for the response. And generally, um, typically what you would see is, for most a TBI children, is, is a lack of maturity of responses, difficulty generating solutions, um, problems identifying um, appropriate language and understanding context. What was very interesting when this was set up in a VR situation, and what we came to learn was, is there's an additional component in the context of social learning and uh, social interactions where children were also breaking down. So in <clears throat> where we were seeing in the laboratory, if you will, um, difficulty identifying emotion and understanding, and then once those skills were taught, there still to seemed to be an additional breakdown in the context of trying to engage socially. When they were introduced the concept of the VR task, so basically now the children had to rate or understand social conversation in the context of an actual virtual environment. So here are two kids who are actually having a conversation, a conflict or dilemma is set up and they have to solve it. Basically at that point the child has to try to understand not just what's going on with the individual um, with, from a language perspective in terms of what's being said, but they also had to understand the auditory processing, so the intonation, the language. So what started to come out now is with the integration of, of watching and being able to measure how children were interacting in a social context, was to see the difficulty in processing the emotional content layer. So basically, the the prosodic cues that happen in a particular conversation, understanding intonation, understanding um, how basically what was happening because there's so many, cons so many aspects of the interaction that they're trying to break down, they forget sort of what's relevant and what's irrelevant in the conversation. And basically at that point, um, they have a, their solutions or understanding of how to engage socially um, are quite depleted. So in the context of treatment, so what has developed consequently is to set up, so there's a number of, and this is, has started to, to come up particularly emerging in the autism literature, where what we're seeing is um, virtual environments for kids where they have to interpret social settings and situations in that environment. And then in the safety of with a therapist or another individual can help to figure out how to generate ideas, how to generate solutions to complex social problems, how to engage, how to interact. Um, hopefully helping them to reduce some of the social difficulties that they're experiencing. So VREST has been one of the technologies that um, has been used quite widely in the autism, um, with the autism group, and um, started to see some work with, the, with TBI kids using this kind of technology. There's a lot of physical rehabilitation we've seen. Um, the Connect, I think one of the nice things again now about Connect um, and these particular technologies is that they will allow this now to be used in in-home rehabilitation and it's more accessible. So between the e-rehab um, and the technology, this is something that now has greater accessibility in home for people and can be more affordable. There's a lot of um, attention training programs, inhibitory control tasks, particularly where VR is being developed is with executive cognitive function. So it's the kind of things that are difficult to uh, break down in a, in a laboratory sort of 
way. It's the planning, it's the organization, it's how to go about tasks. Um, so a lot of these environments are what being explored to move into a virtual environment to be able to evaluate and treat more effectively. Certainly there's been a long history of VR use with uh, treatment of phobias and anxieties. So you initially saw that iPhone in which um, the virtual environments are set up and it's used a lot for people with plane phobias, with uh, spider phobias, other things like that. And it provides an opportunity to start developing strategies with a desensitization process to be exposed to that particular stimuli before then moving into the real world um, aspect. It's had a lot of work with um, pain patients uh, with a lot of success. So a lot of the VR environments in terms of helping clients deal with pain has been um, shown some nice research outcomes in that area too. And certainly in driving simulation. And it's very interesting given the amount of issues that we deal with in TBI with regard to driving, it's not had a lot of uptake um, from a rehabilitation perspective from, um, with regard to clinical practice, which is very interesting. So to date, um, what's been very nice is that um, it is an emerging technology, but the literature very clearly supports that there's really strong correlations between the skills, uh, the real, real world skills and these virtual environments. So there's good validity and reliability in using these kinds of environments um, with respect to not only assessment, but also treatment. They're good staging opportunities. It's the good first step before jumping into the full out classroom, the full out work area, the full out environment. It's a great practice domain. You can contain failure, you can contain, you know, uh, or help to deal with the anxiety and emotions that come up in, um, related to these uh, environments. Certainly, the virtual exercise and game-based programs show positive um, collaborative uh, correlative effects. There's a um, wide range of potential for rehab use. Um, there are also um, some of the data coming out of more recent studies shows good correlation of test components with the cognitive skills, good test retest. So a lot of things that, that I think make this a very promising technology with respect to rehabilitation. So what's been the issue with uptake? Basically, one of the, um, one of the things that we looked at was the context of um, we asked various therapists, occupational therapists, rehab therapists, recreational therapists, and looked at their, um, looked at their attitudes um, about this technology, about how to implement it, and what some of the barriers are to implementation. Because given some of the wide availability of some of these technologies with respect to virtual um, and e-rehab, there hasn't been a significant amount of uptake. So in general, what we're finding is that there's relatively good atti positive attitude towards the technology. There's some perceived, they do perceive some, some benefit to it. But the, some of the big areas of, of difficulty, which I think one of the major ones being the accessibility. So if you go back to one of the first slides, when it was still that big technology, it was not particularly accessible. Really what therapists are saying is if it's an easy technology, it's easy to set up, easy to program, easy to go in, easy to go out, the ease of use is a significant barrier or facilitator to actually using these kinds of technologies. And I think in the last couple of years there's been such a rapid development making them more accessible, more affordable, uh, and more usable that hopefully that will increase that adoption. One of the interesting things um, that came up is I think people, one of the concerns in the adoption of, of these kinds of technologies has also been, does it replace me? And I think part of the concern for many therapists has been, well, if someone can just you know, plug in you know, a box and do exercises, what's my role? And I think, you know, it's a, it's a significant misconception because, again, it's much like the brain training gyms and so on. People can't just sit and do an isolated activity and expect it to translate into function. So again, without the integration of, um, of a therapist into the process, it's really not going to work particularly well. And as, as Dee had said, it's really um, a tool in the toolbox. 
if you need to work on issue, if you have a patient that, uh, particularly kids, with regard to doing some of the rehab, the very repetitive rehabilitation activities, doing something in a virtual environment is much more interesting, increases compliance, um, and makes it more accessible for them as well. Um, so I think, again, as, um, so as one of some of the uh, clinical directions that we wanted to take a look at in particular is looking at the ongoing integration and development, particularly in the cognitive domain. Certainly in the physical domain, this technology has taken off um, substantially, uh, the robotics and so on. Certainly in the cognitive domain, it has lacked signif behind significantly. So there's a lot with the um, emerging technologies. The idea is, is that we can start creating more and more virtual environments, um, working with companies like Gentronics and so on, and moving it towards um, looking at the psychological, behavioral, and um, cognitive domains as a way to uh, continue to develop this technology. And I think, oh, and I think that's it. Any questions? What is Connect? Connect is um, Microsoft's version of um, sort of like the Xbox. So it is the platform by which you would that delivers sort of the technology. So if you look at sort of Gentronics, they use sort of that Connects. It's the actual physical. delivery of, of, the, of the programs and the system. Can I talk to you after? Sure. <laughs> if Mark's there, if you want to ask me about the technology itself, sure. <laughs> yes. You mentioned inhibitory control tasks. Mm -hmm. Is that something that you have Yeah, it's been, it's, so the application is certainly both in the context of pediatrics and, and adults as well. So it's, again, it's sort of setting up uh, age-appropriate situations and, uh, and, and uh, scenarios for the individual, allowing them to practice those strategies, for sure, yeah. It's a great, it's a great practice pla platform. And um, unlike some of the other technologies, definitely has a great correlation with actual outcome. And there's, it is a platform by which you can actually practice a strategy and move it to a functional domain. What's been interesting is, is that the computer technology, such as brain gyms and so on, have had this massive billion dollar explosion, but very little research indicating at this point whether you know, there's any real world functional transference. But people sort of like it. I think it's because of the ease of use. It's a big deal. It's, it's something easy I can, e I can easily give somebody. I can easily connect them to. But again, the, transfers, the functional trans, uh, transfer is uh, at this point in terms of, of, of the research is really poor. So, yes. Basically, at this point, in terms of um, the access, a lot of it's off the internet. A lot of the programs are, are in earlier development. But basically, what you're looking at for, in the physical domain, uh, it's not difficult to integrate. So a lot of the actual physical activities are part of what you would do as part of a physical program anyway. It just breaks them all down. It's, it makes it easy to measure and so on. Um, in the cognitive domains and the social domains, the programs exist. I think if you have the therapist there, you're working through it, you'll realize it's so like a lot of the practical tasks you're working on anyway, because they're very practical in nature, and you're just helping to, in, you're using that as a platform to, div, to, to deliver your strategies. Other than technology, so if you're. <laughs> Using computers, using sort of being able to, but yeah, not in, in actual use of it, no. Okay, thank you.